My name is Rahul Maitra. I'm a CPA, but I also do living revocable trusts. Um, I'm also a licensed insurance broker in the state of Virginia. That includes retirement planning. Uh, insurance broker sells health, life, and annuities. Um, let me just say that this is going to be an introductory, uh, very first step to trusts. It can get very, I don't know, advanced and more complex. You got to keep in mind that there's a lot of people out there in this world. There's, you know, you got to think about, just think about like all the people who are kind of like in their 30s and 40s and all of us, you know, or a lot of us still have our parents left. Uh, they're still living, but our parents are older than us. Our parents going to be 60, 70. My parents are in their 70s. Older people might have uh, parents even older than that. And so I want to start at basically the baseline that I think really applies to everyone. In the future, I'm definitely going to go into more advanced, I'll call it case studies with different options and different things that you can do. But this is literally called Estate Planning 101 because it is, this is sort of the starting point. I think this is sort of the entry level point for looking at trusts and all this stuff. So that's why I call this Estate Planning 101. And I'm definitely gonna give more ideas on how you can do more advanced structures and include, and basically if you look at folks like the Rockefeller family. There's a lot of like very notable cases where trusts have been the difference between a, f a wealthy family keeping their wealth uh, over generations. And then you have families like the Vanderbilts that were arguably more wealthy than the Rockefellers, but they didn't manage things the same. I'll go into that stuff at some later date, but that's trusts are kind of an important thing. So understanding estate planning. So what comprises the estate? So everyone has an estate and that estate is basically everything you own. You can think about it in terms of titled assets like buildings, land, real estate, deeded properties. Uh, oh, these are deeded and then titled properties. Titled properties are cars, vehicles, equipment, trailers, boats. There's lots of things that actually fall into that. These are usually taxed. These have a tax. These are taxed as well. Any kind of checking account, money market inbound, in, in investment account. When I say investments, that can mean 401ks. That can mean IRA accounts. And then there's mutual funds, money market, any stuff like that. And then there's this other realm of life insurance. And one thing I'll go into on some other presentations is that if you have absolutely nothing at all, like a lot of people might think, well, I don't have any money. You know, I don't have anything. I'm 20, I'm 30. Well, everyone could actually fund their trust initially with a life insurance policy. And it could even be like a, a term policy or something like that. But it really is a game changer. Let me just say this one thing and then I'll move on. If you're a young person and you think about creating a, a trust, you could actually create a trust that can last, you know, 300 years and you can fund it with a life insurance policy. And that's something. And imagine if you're a young person and you're thinking broad along those lines, you're thinking long term, you're not going to be like partying. It's, for you know, uh, St. Patrick's Day. And you're not going to get crunk and like uh, necessarily just live for the moment if you set something like this up and actually force yourself to, well, you know, if I pay this much a month, I'm actually going to be amassing, you know, life insurance that will dump into this trust someday. And I'll be able to pass that on to someone. If I have kids, you know, if you don't even have kids yet, it'll it'll help you think long term. Anyways. And then there's furniture and other types of stuff like that. So no matter how large or small, everyone has an estate. All right, so let's go over the core documents that are in in the trust as well. So we have so we have essentially the the centerpiece, which is the living revocable trust itself. It puts your intentions for succession into a contract. 
and you're uh, it's essentially managing your, your estate. Uh, it's 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 a, you could think of it as a management vehicle, but really it's a it's a contract. And um, the fact that it's a contract holds some weight. And there's a lot, we'll go into what is actually in this and the provisions that are called. But this is essentially now the revocable trust itself. This is not a public document. This is going to be something that only the family has the or the beneficiaries. And you could even, you know, determine who you want to share that to. You don't, I mean, ideally, I think the beneficiary should know it and see it, but you could just have you, the person who created it, called the trustor and the trustee. The trustee is the person who really manages it. Now, you can have all three people be the same. You can be the trustor, the one who created it. You can have you can be the trustee, the one who manages it, and you could be the beneficiary, or you could split those up. But anyways, this is a private document, and it is your uh, intentions expressed in a contract. And then you have a what's called a certificate of trust. Now, the certificate of trust is essentially proof that the trust exists and that authority from the trust exists. And this is a document that enables you to keep that revocable trust private, but then you can present this to the court. You can present this to the bank. That might come up when we're at a later stage called settling the estate. We'll go into all that as well. Then we have what's called the last will and testament. Now, most people only heard about this. Oh, you got to fill out your last will and testament. Now, in a proper like estate plan where you have a living a revocable living trust. Now, I'll say living revocable trust or revocable living trust. I've seen it said both ways. So if I call it diff different things, don't worry about that. Now, the last will and testament could actually exist right alongside this revocable living trust because the last will and testament is something that can go on the public record. That is something that can go to court. And if it goes to court, that's considered it's on the public record. And so they have what's called, if you have a living revocable trust, they have what's called a pour over will. And all that's doing is it's saying, now a, a living revocable trust. If we go to that, remember the last slide, what is in your estate? Well, think about the revocable living trust or living revocable trust as a suitcase that you're putting all your stuff in. And essentially, uh, that's a private thing. Now, the last will and testament, let's say you go on a trip and you put your stuff in your suitcase. Let's say you forgot some clothes or some underwear at home. Your last will and testament is basically saying, and th this pour over will specifically, is basically saying, look to the trust for my intentions. And anything that is not expressly listed in the revocable living trust, we will put it in the revocable living trust and it will be directed as directed by the living revocable trust. So it's literally just saying, hey, anything we missed that's in the public sphere, that's not already listed and accounted for, we're also going to just say, hey, look at that trust, go according to the trust. Okay, so that's how the will can work with the with the trust. And then you have three things that exist when you're still living. Now, this certificate of trust, last will, and testament, and these three are for when you're when you've passed away. Um, now, they also can, you know, put things in, you know, when you're living too. But it's really for your intentions for when you pass away. Now, the last three: the durable power of attorney over finances, durable power of attorney over healthcare. And the advanced medical directives, these are and which is called a living will. These are for when you're really in like incapacitated. You're living, but you're in a state where, God forbid, something happens to you and you can't, you know, give your intentions. You can't say what you want done. Um, you're going to the durable power of attorney is basically you picking someone who, in the realm of finances, will be able to make those decisions while you're still alive. 
Um, the durable power of attorney for healthcare is basically that in the realm of healthcare, you're still alive. This person, now you're going to give your wishes and intentions to that person, but you're designating a person to have that control. And then you might want, oh, and then you have the advanced medical directives. This is, if you have to go to the hospital, that's what the hospital is actually going to ask for first and foremost. Do you have advanced medical directives or a living will? And this is going to literally state your intentions for all kinds of stuff uh, regarding, you know, do you want um, them to feed you through a tube? Do you want them to put you on a respirator? There's all kinds of very specifics that you can have uh, your choices uh, and intentions laid out for to give to the hospital. Now, you might wonder, why is there a living will and also a durable power of attorney over healthcare? Well, let's say you have a, there's a mom and the son lives on the other side of the country and you just can't get a hold of him. Well, you have your advanced medical directive and living will right there as well in case that person just can't show up. The next is understanding that everybody already has a plan. Now, the default plan is the government plan. That's the catch-all, because a lot of people just don't have anything set. And so the government has, you know, it's not like, oh, they're trying to <laughs> screw you over or whatever, but they have a plan that, Unfortunately, it's all sort it's all in the public sphere. The government's plan has to be out in the open because it's literally it's you know the government trying to figure out what to do after you've passed away. And they call that the probate process. The default would be you take no action at all, you have no plan in place, and it'll automatically go to probate. If you just have a will and testament, that is a you know indication of your uh, it's not considered a contract. It's more like a wish list. And essentially, it literally is something that you're presenting to the court. So that, again, is a public, ends up being public, and you're just presenting it to probate, and the judge must rule on it. But you've stated your intentions, but the judge ultimately rules on it and has that final say. And... Keep in mind that the probate process, uh, depending on what state you are, some states have a very high percentage rate where they might have a floor, you know, under, like in Virginia, it's like under 15,000, you don't pay anything. But if if you're a $15,001 of stuff, it is immediately taxed. Now, some states have high tax rates. California has like an 8% rate. Um, and then there's also the time. The probate is a court court is always it's kind of bogged down and slow and there's all it's just bureau, bureaucracy it's just it could take i mean i i have a lot of friends who are like in their 70s i hang around a bunch of these old jewish guys in my area and you know this guy alan's telling me when his mom died she didn't have any of that in place um i don't even think she had a will and he was in court for like 18 months. So these things could take lots and lots of time. And then the last thing that could actually fall into the government's plan is, let's say you do set up a living revocable trust, but you don't fund it. And I'll explain what that is. Funding, like a living revocable trust, remember, is a contract. It's paperwork. You know, when you go to a lawyer, he drafts up the contract, but you have to really, you have to do two things. You have to execute that contract by getting it notarized and all that stuff. But then you got to actually like put the estate, the titled pro uh, properties like the equipment, the deeded properties like land and real estate and your bank accounts and all, all of those need to actually be changed to the name of if it's me, like Rahul Maitra, trustee of the Maitra Family Trust, they have to actually be changed and funded means you're changing the name of all these things and putting it into the trust itself. If you don't do that last step, and even if you have a living revocable trust, and even if it's executed, which means notarized and number of witnesses and all that, 
it still will go to court because those accounts, if the account's still in your mom's name, not in the trust, it's still going to go to the court. And now it might be easier. Uh, it might be speedier, but the court ultimately gets to rule on that. And then people can contest it. If someone's like, well, if there's a bunch of people in your family, if there's a bunch of, if there's, you know, basically families that don't get along, someone could be like, well, this is unfair and contested in court. And this, as, if any of it's in the public realm, this probate realm, people can contest it. It's just problematic. Predators, public realm is, you know, is the venue for these things. Now, the other thing is an intentional plan that you set, which is when you have a properly funded living revocable trust, which is the contract that's executed plus putting the assets and naming them, putting them into the name of the trust. And yeah, just to reiterate, it's a contract essentially documenting your intent and it creates a management structure by which you own your assets and then those assets can be managed or controlled on your behalf when you're incapable of doing so. So it's basically stating who that succession person is and who's going to be getting all of that stuff. Okay, so let's just go a little bit deeper into the default plan, that uh, an outline of the probate process itself. Let's just understand it. Let's just get into, okay, let's say you don't have anything set in place. What is the default? Well, a formal petition is filed for the court and there's fees associated with that for this formal petition. Now, if you have a will um, and in that will, you can say you can have a what's called a personal representative. Personal re uh, representative is kind of like the trustee. It's the person who will be managing the process, who will be settling your estate. Um, and that person is responsible for the entire process. So if you have a will, you can say who that person is, which is good, you know, but it's just part of the thing. And then you have family. You can also have a legal representative manage the process. If no one in your family, you know, is really up, you know, can do it. You can hire a legal person to do that. You know, that costs, you know, money. If you don't have a person that you can do it. Uh, just so you know, on the trust side too, I mean, let's say you want to have a trust. You can actually make a living revocable trust last hundreds of years. You can make a living revocable trust last 365 years. And you can name the first trustee. And then for each trustee after that, you can make it so that that's a fiduciary person, someone who's a CPA or in the trust department of a bank. And let's say you just don't have anyone, but or and but you or you want to put it in, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing to hire someone to manage the estate. We'll get into that a little bit later, and that's going to be the subject of a, you know, in, later in the series, I'm going to go into more advanced ways that you can do this, where you can take this initial structure. And I'm just going to show the the most normal basic form that most people take, but we'll we'll go into that stuff um, at a later time. But it can get you can get more sophisticated with it. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. So anyways, you can hire a legal representative. And if there's no will, the court is going to appoint a representative to oversee the process. And they're going to have to pay that person out of the estate. Again, whittling the money down, whereas in the trust, you can you don't have to have the person be paid necessarily. Okay, now, since this is in the public domain, they got to do two things, certificates and notifications. Now, each of these certificates, you know, are costing money, you know, 20 bucks. Notifications cost, you know, up to 300 bucks. These are sent to the beneficiaries, heirs, and to creditors on the notification side, and certificates are sent to, you know, basically all kinds, you know, whatever financial institutions, maybe to if you had utilities set up in the person's name. Basically, they're notifying, hey, the people, um, this person has passed away, and the court is going to do that as part of the process. It's notifying people. And if you don't have anyone to do it, the court's going to just take it upon themselves to 
do that because like how else would it get done if you had no one and no plan that petition's got to be served to you know all the beneficiaries named in the will if there's a will that costs money and so you got to notify so right there let's say you have a will you have a bunch of beneficiaries the court's still going to pay you know charge you to send those notifications to all the people listed in the will again a reason why you want to not have it go to court at all and in the event there's no will it must be served on an uh, on all interstate not interstate but it's it's a legal term interstate heirs of the decedent so again it has to be served a notification that's just the default if you got nothing else and there may be special proceed how are we doing on time all right I've got to pick it up here. <laughs> there may be special procedures required in the particular jurisdiction. You know, there might be other things too. All right. Now, the personal representative, that's a huge role. So let's look at all the things that they go through. I'm going to go a little faster here. So you got to catalog all of the property, all of their stuff, real estate, vehicles, personal property. You got to catalog all of that. So that could be some random person you know, some representative from the state. It could be someone you name in the will. Uh, it could be a lawyer that you guys hire. You got to pay any debts or claims on taxes that are due. They're going to want to pay that stuff off. And that's something you're going to want to do too. Even, you know, in a, in a, you know, living revocable trust, you want to do that as well. Collecting rights to any income, you know, again, it's just, it's doing essential a, uh, a financial fire drill, you could think of it, or an audit, where they're basically cataloging all the stuff you have, all of your income sources, if you have any, you know, if you got investment account, whatever it is, uh, settling finance, settling disputes. If there's people who are like, hey, I feel like this is unfair, they got to settle all those disputes, that personal representative. They got to file that final income tax for that person. They got to do uh, an estate tax return if, you know, if it's a lot of money, if it's a high net worth individual. You got to basically do all the accounting for the assets and expenses, that financial fire drill. If there's creditor claims, again, you know, you got to litigate that stuff, which litigate means <laughs> law, law stuff, court, uh, you know, lawsuits. And then you got to distribute the stuff you got to distribute or transfer the assets they'll be uh they may be required to post bond part some of the you know some of the state's jurisdictions they'll make this person pay an ex an additional fee depending on the value of the estate and that person's credit score to act in this way so i mean that's just another consideration more money coming out of the estate okay so to finish up the probate process, this is probably the longest part, just the explanation of this long probate process. So once you have personal reps, there's going to be, there may be challenges. They're going to issue testamentary letters um, to that person. And it's going to, those letters basically empower that personal representative uh, to enforce the terms of the will and all the stuff when dealing with banks you know, people that, you know, real estate people, if, you know, you have to sell the property, anything that requires proof of this personal representative, that's what that, it's called the issue, the testamentary letter. And it gives, uh, the court is giving the authority to that person on behalf of the person's estate. And then um, after that appointment, after this letter is given to serve, no, you will, you got to serve that as well. So not only... No, you know, you have to serve uh, all the people that the person has passed away and all of that. You also have to serve everyone who this personal representative is. And then the creditors are, might have a period of time in which they have to, they could file a claim. Remember, anything that's on the will is in the public realm. And sometimes that's a reason, by the way, why you might want to have a small bank account with not a lot of money in that in the will and not necessarily in the trust because to pay off creditors, but then the creditors won't have access to the other stuff. Okay. And after a period of time, the creditors will 
basically lose claim to anything that they think that they're owed. And then they have to um, prepare and file, again, the inventory of all of the assets of the estate. And some things require appraisal, real estate, personal items, uh, maybe automobiles and that sort of thing. You know, appraisals, that's another thing where you have to find someone and hire someone to do that. Again, that's why it's just, it. the process takes a while. And since it's all on the government record and you have to present this to the judge in that probate court, you can't do this on your own time. You have to basically keep going to court to present all these different things, even up to the appraisal process. All right. And then there's a whole time burden. So it's very detail oriented. It takes time. It's almost like a second job. It is like a job. And I and just ask around, ask anyone you know who's had to go to probate, ask them what it was like, and you'll hear terrible, terrible stories. It's just, it takes a lot of time. And so a lot of people will just hire someone to do it because they can't afford the time to do it. And you're going to have to pay for that. And it's all open to the public. I mean, I'll say it again. The court system is in the public domain. All of this is on the public side. Now, the reason having a revocable trust is it actually, it bypasses the probate process is because it actually does. These are the responsibility of what probate court is supposed to do. Pay out debts. Get that final income tax return filed, you know, um, verifying the debts, you know, assigning guardianship to if there's kids, you know, distributing the assets. This is why it might take a while, a long time, but that's essentially what the court is trying to do. They're trying to do the right thing, but they're slow and it's costly. Now, the reason why the trust works in the first place is because it's doing the thing the probate court would have to do and the difference between the you know the will is just the wish document that the judge must rule on and it's not a contract and it's still subject to the court whereas the trust is the legal contract and you know whether it's a, a single person a married person they get to give their intentions on how their estate is settled it's an executed document. It's signed in front of a notary with two witnesses, and that makes it a legal contract. And um, and it accomplishes what the probate process does. Okay. Now, unlike the probate process, you can do other stuff too. You can basically, there are special provisions to, you can name a successor trustee. You can protect uh, beneficiaries. This this might come here. I'll, I'll explain this in, in a little bit, but essentially, let's say that you have someone who's a reckless, drug-abusing kid who's not good with the money. Well, you can totally customize it so that you're saying that this person can't, you know, has to be off drugs before they can receive their money. Or they get, if it's like a little kid, you know, at the time of death, you can make it so that they receive money when they're 15 and then 18. And you can, you know, stage how the money is released. Or you can make it so that they get a certain amount every year. You can make it any way you want. And um, it gives you a tremendous amount of control, too. You can make it so the trust matches the down payment of a house. So if you have kids, multiple kids, it's encouraging the kids to work you can have it so that you are earning as much as you earn on your own. So you're matching the sap the income. So if you actually have like a big estate, you're preventing your kids from being <laughs> from basically doing nothing. And you could actually make them take part in in order to get paid from the trust, you can make them do, you know, if you want them to do charitable stuff, you can make them have to be involved in charities that you dictate. There's like just so much you can, these are all different provisions and you can always make changes to this. It's called revocable because you can make changes all throughout your life. And then when you do pass away, it can become, 
irrevocable and lock in your intentions and then they'll be carried out according to your wishes. Now, ultimately, this is your choice. And, you know, when is the best time to do the estate plan? Well, the answer is going to be, you know, there really is no reason why you should be waiting on this. It's something to have in place at any time because, you know, you could, anyone could die at any time in some car accident or you, you just don't know. And so the options, all of this is how your choice, you know, it's all your choice. So getting a trust is also your choice the way you can do it. You can go and get an estate planning attorney and they'll draft up the documents. Now, the problem is a lot of attorneys, they just, attorneys tend to charge a lot. They tend to charge by the hour and they're not involved in that funding process at the end. Most of the times they're giving you the documents Maybe they're notarizing it. They have a notary in their office and they get them executed. But uh, this is a shocking fact, but 80% of people who even get go to that estate planning attorney, get those documents executed, 80% do not even do the last step and fund the trust and put the stuff in the trust name. Basically, it's rendering those documents powerless and it still then goes to probate. So you can go to an attorney. You can, um, they have, if you search, there's different softwares that you can go. I remember I got a, uh, you know, a Susie Orman DVD a while ago. And she's like, well, there's a template for a trust. So you can get like a document template in uh, really inexpensive software. But uh, with that stuff, again, you're doing it yourself. And um, remember, these are legal documents. Now, I'm not an attorney. Uh, essentially, just so you know, attorneys, they're all using software too. When you go to an attorney to do this stuff, they have their own subscription to a software. They're just, you know, jotting in your, <laughs> your wishes. Um, and it's just generating those documents, but you're just going to an attorney and they don't tell you that. And they could make it last longer. The do-it-yourself uh, option. Now, this is this is a uh, a legal thing, and you want you want the attorney um, drafted law. I mean, language in there. So if you um, go to DIY, I mean, if you start modifying the text there, it might not be uh, legally sound. So, anyways, um, and then a lot of times you just don't have someone basically with you you don't really have any guidance uh, or limited guidance or you know it's uh you know they just don't have you know people to really help and then they have kind of a blend of the two where they have essentially uh what i'm doing is essentially a guided estate plan and you you can work with a financial uh professional um i'm working essentially with a i've partnered with a a software platform where it's all essentially just like the attorneys have their uh, software that's written and designed by attorneys and it's a software platform, that same platform now, they're basically partnering with other people who are CPAs, people who are financial planners, people who uh, sell insurance, because a lot of times here's another thing. Attorneys are not specialists in accounting. You know, they're a specialist in law, but not perhaps the finance stuff, accounting or life insurance. Like I didn't know anything about it. I was a CPA for many years and I got my life insurance much later in life. But, you know, these people just have knowledge of finance stuff, tax stuff that, you know, the estate planning attorney is not going to have. And they have the same access to that software. So anyways. So let's say you wanted to do this. Um, let's just understand. Okay, let's see how much time we got about 15 minutes. Okay, so let's just keep moving here. So understand the whole process of setting this up and basically creating a timeline to complete this stuff. So phase one is you got to just figure out who these key people are. Who's going to be your trustee? And if you are planning to make this living revocable trust something that lasts 
hundred, you know, a couple hundred years, you can actually figure out who's the trustee after that trustee and so forth. And the beneficiaries, you can actually get real detailed and it could be, but basically you can go down a bloodline succession or, you know, you can really figure out who is it that you want this to go to. And even if you don't want to get complicated, let's say it's just going to be the, the trustee, the beneficiary, maybe they're the same person. You know, it's a it's a mom trying to set up a trust and she wants to pass it on to her son. Totally normal. Nothing wrong with that. But who are those beneficiaries? If she has a bunch of kids, what if one of them's, you know, not a good person? I mean, I don't know. You can you can disinherit people too. power of attorney, all of those things. You got to figure out who those people are. And then you're going to essentially go and sit and customize that trust document and make it exactly and you're going to go provision by provision and get as detailed as you want to be and or it could be simple as simple as you want it to be but you're essentially picking uh, and that goes for all of those all of those documents the power of attorney all of you know you're setting and you're going through that all of that stuff the next step is executing the documents which means you're taking all these documents and now different states have different requirements some places don't require two witnesses but no one's gonna get you in trouble for having the highest standard which is where a lot of states most or i think a lot of states are moving to adopt this uh and it sort of changes but What's happening is the states are moving towards more and more of the towards the higher standard, which is two witnesses and a notary, and the witness cannot be someone named in the trust. So, uh, and ideally, you're going to have the person who helped you create the trust document be right there when you're getting that stuff notarized, and so you can meet the witnesses, you can meet all the people. You know what I mean? Then you have auditing your assets and liabilities. So that is where. You're doing the financial fire drill. You're figuring out all the titled assets, deeded assets, bank accounts, investment accounts, insurance policies, personal properties, furniture, music, you know, art, musical equipment, anything else that you want to pass on. And then liabilities. What do you owe money for? Do you have credit card bills? Do you have mortgages? What needs to get paid off? Because you want to do that too. You don't want to leave your beneficiaries with a bunch of debt to deal with. You want to essentially take care of that. And then the next step is putting all of those things into the name of the trust, which is the critical funding the trust step. And then you want to basically meet with all the people, all the beneficiaries and the people in the family, all the people involved. You want to essentially have them understand the roles of what settling the estate looks like. First off, I would just have everyone understand. Now, you don't necessarily, uh, this is not a meeting where you're going over who gets what, because those can, you know, <laughs> that can always get testy. But you're going, what are the, what is the role of settling the estate? Who are the people doing that? Who are the power of attorney people? Getting those people the documents so they have them right then and there at all times they know they have access to them at all times and with the software platform i'm working with like all of that is in one central place where you can log in and it's not just you know you have these physical documents you can have all that stuff scanned and uploaded into a central place and in that moment where you know you're panicking and it's just stressful if someone has a fucking heart attack out of nowhere sometimes it's just really stressful and knowing you got all your stuff there and you have your plan and everyone's gone over it and now everyone else has heard the plan and could back each other up and you know be there for each other and hey we all know what we're gonna do a good goal rule of thumb is to try to get all this done in 60 days the funding the trust is the longest part and a lot of people just are just very they just procrastinate you don't want to do that. You want to get all that done. All right. So creating the trust documents. Let's just, uh, we're running out of time. So let me just, um, okay. So there's different provisions. They have the standard where basically everything is going to, you know, the beneficiaries who you name. 
But then they have what's called the AB trust option. Now, back in the day, it used to just be the AB option, but that is useful if you have a blended family. Let's say you get married more than once. Let's say you have a first, you know, a, a first wife and a child with that first wife, and then you remarry, and then you have kids with another person. Well, you can actually set it so the child from that first family, when the uh, let's say the the father dies, like it essentially splits into two trusts: a trust A and a trust B. And the trust A could go to that first, uh, the child from the first marriage, and the trust B could then go into the that, that can remain to be living, and so that. Trust A is locked into place, and the B is a living, it continues to be living, and the, the wife of the second marriage, she gets to still, um, it's still living in that effect, and then when she dies, it goes to the, her beneficiary. So you can do that. You can make it so that at the end, it locks into place when you die, or you could keep it so that it is changeable. So that's another option. Now, if you want to have the IRA, because IRAs and uh, 401ks are treated sort of different in the financial realm, and they're held to a, kind of a different standard. And so essentially, if you want the IRA to pass to the trust, you can do that, but you have to make it so that you are not the trustor, the person creating the trust is not also the trustee. So we can go into all that uh, if you're interested, but uh, you can do that. And they have, it's a see-through qualification. It's basically for later thing, you know, later um, uh, presentations I'll be giving, they have irrevocable trusts and these trusts have more um, basically asset protection. And what you're doing is you're giving up the power to make the changes, but by giving up that power, it gives you um, other benefits. So that's what, you know, the more power you give up, the more there's reasons to do that. All right, then you can have separate property. You can have it if you had like a prenuptial agreement. You could have separate property or you can make everything community property. And you could have divorce provisions. You can make it so the trust dissolves if you guys get divorced. You can have it in the provisions where one party of the divorce cannot use the trust to hurt the other person of the divorce. The spendthrift provisions. If you don't want to give all your money to kids all at once because they're just not responsible yet, they're not ready yet, you could set it any way you want. And then if you have provisions for minor kids, you know, you could create joint trusts that go to these kids. Or if you have a special needs or disabled adult, you go to a lawyer, a lot of times it'd be like, well, you need a special needs trust. Well, that's just not true. You can actually create special needs provisions and it'll make it so that a lot of times, if you're special needs, you're disabled, you're getting benefits from the state. And if you get too much income, if a lot of times you're given all this money at once, so when someone dies, you lose your state benefits, you can make it so that they have someone who sort of looks after it for them and they don't lose their state benefits. All there's So there's tons and tons of provisions. So you could set up who the beneficiaries are. Beneficiaries can be charities too, if you want. You can disherit people if, you know, you don't want, you know, one person is just a, a criminal, drug user, bad person who, you know, is who hates the, whatever it is. I don't know. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> but you can do that if you want, but you have to actually state it in the trust if you do want to do that, or it can be contested. So you can state that if you want. And also the trustee selection, you can, you know, who that's going to be. You can even make it so that, you pick the first trustee and then every trustee after that has to be someone with fiduciary responsibilities, like a lawyer, like a CPA, or like there's a trust department in banks. And you can just make it so that that department is in place so that you don't always want to just have the trustee be the beneficiaries because once that's the case, they could be like, well, we want to spend whatever the hell we want. And, you know, if you want to actually make it a 300 year old living revocable trust, that pays off and you're paying, you know, a life insurance policy into, or you get a life insurance policy on yourself and then you get one for all your kids and all of them are just paying into that and building the value of this trust and you get some Rockefeller money, you can make it so that that trust is managed by someone who is, you know, has a fiduciary responsibility and isn't going to be reckless and is holding it to the intentions that you're stating, 
You know, you can actually get really specific if you want. The same thing with the, you're setting up the power of attorney, healthcare, advanced directives, living will. You're setting up all these things and you can get real specific, way more than you can on the back of a driver's license for that organ donation. Next, you got to execute the trust and then restating the trust documents. Okay, so executing it, remember, it's best to just do the highest practice, two witnesses and a notary, and the witnesses are not named in the trust. Restating the trust documents. Okay, so the beauty of, you know, if you go to a lawyer, if you want to restate it, if you want to make changes to any of, to a lot of this, sometimes you have to, uh, I mean, with a lawyer, you're, they're probably going to, you know, charge you every single time. And that's, you know, uh, if you don't mind that, that's, you know, a thing, but they'll likely charge you every single time you're making changes to anything. Now, with the platform that I'm working with, you can basically make unlimited uh, changes to the trust documents. But if you make changes to some things, you got to get them notarized again with the witnesses. You got to get them executed again. Other things don't require that. So let's just go into what the difference is. Okay, so these things require a trust restatement. Restatement means you have to get them executed again. And it's not a big deal, but you, you can change the, you know, so if you're changing the state of residence, you're changing any provisions in the trust, you're adding kids, you're changing distributions, you're removing a beneficiary, you're changing a trustee or the executor of that trust. And if you're removing or adding any titled assets or, you know, deeded properties, then you might have to re-notarize the whole thing. Again, not a big deal. You make the new version, get it re-notarized and upload it, and you're good. Um, or if you don't have the platform, if you go with a lawyer, you know, just you'll have the physical documents somewhere. Now, some things don't require getting it re-notarized, changing um, before you execute the documents, you can make changes, of course, as much as you want. If you want to change the uh, power of attorney, financial agent, power of attorney, health, that doesn't require. That requires just changing that particular document. Healthcare power of attorney, that's its own document. That's not the trust document. So you can change that without having to change the trust. Same thing with the advanced medical directives. That's its own document. You don't have to get the main trust redone. And then if you're adding or removing or changing bequests for personal stuff for your easy bake oven or your guitar, you don't have to change that. You can add stuff as life goes on. Let's say you make it when you're 20 or 30 or 40 and you get stuff over the years, you can just add to it over time. No big deal. You don't have to get it re-notarized. And then funding the trust. So remember there's deeded properties, homeland real estate uh there's titled properties now if you're going uh with me and uh we actually work with a third party for deeded properties called deedworks deedworks makes it really easy let's say you don't have the original you know deed to your property let's say you don't have a lot of these and these things just require going to the courthouse but you'd be surprised how many people just like don't want to do it or like it's, a, it's an older mom or something, and she's just like, doesn't feel, oh, you know, I don't know if I'll do it right. You can have a third party do it, and it really doesn't cost that much. We can go over costs if you want some later time. Titled properties, again, a trip to the D, uh, DMV will usually do it. Bank investment, you got to just reach out to these accounts, but it's not like probate where it's, you, you have to do it and then go back to the judge after each of these. You can do it on your own time but you got to go do it. And then insurance policies too. You can, you know, moving all of these. So that's, this is the critical step. And then settling the estate. Okay, so once you die, um, there's a ton of different tasks. So you got to notify everyone. So you get copies of the death certificate. So whoever that successor trustee, this is why sometimes they'll hire the trustee department in a bank to do it. Um, because it's a lot of roles. So look at all these different roles here. Let's just, you got to get a tax ID. So you don't actually get a tax ID number for the trust until the person dies and passes away. And then you do that. You got to notify, let's say utility bills. 
Social Security, creditors, banks, post office, insurance companies. You got to notify all these people. It is a bit of a job. And you can make it so that that person gets money or something like that. But or you can make it so that person ultimately can, you know, have sort of control and and separate from the beneficiary. So there's more getting stuff appraised. That's still a thing that you got to do. Just because it's not probate court, you still got to get things appraised. So that's another thing. You got to find an appraisal person um, to get that stuff done for different things, you know, homes, vehicles. You got to distribute any bequests, you know, the stuff, get this the person the Ming vase, get this person the equipment. All right, we're almost done, guys. It's 7.30. I wanted to keep this at an hour. And then pay off all remaining creditors. Again, it's just, it's a thing that you have to do in settling the estate. This is a lot of stuff. So this is the stuff you go after, you go over on that meeting. So you're getting everyone to understand the gravity of this role. And, you know, you can have other people know what the things are and keep them on track. And, you know, you got to file that final tax return and then distribute the assets this could be if you're doing a trust that you want for a hundred, you, you got to keep, you know, you got to maintain and manage the distribution of the assets and you can make it so that the principal goes in and then you can only get, you know, the interest. You can, you can get very complicated or you can keep it simple where all the money just goes to someone and it's given to them right away. And you could dissolve the trust too. You can do that too. You don't have to have it last a hundred years. You could have it dissolve and just distribute the assets and then those people can do a trust, you know, the people who get their stuff, they can do their own if they want. Uh, or you could keep that existing one going and, you know, you can, there's lots of ways to customize it. Okay. And then in the field of all this stuff, there's new, like this uh, online platform that I'm working with, you know, so now you can manage your estate documents, which means you have everything in a central place. You can make changes to documents throughout your entire life, and it's just as easy. It's like in a central place where you can log in, and it'll keep like a version memory of all this stuff, and you can just upload anytime you're getting these things notarized. you got an uploaded copy right there. And here's the coolest part, I think, because I'm an accountant, and so if you're tracking assets, one of the things a lot of people don't think about, especially when you're you have a business or something, you got to track those assets for now. The accountant was tracking them for depreciation purposes. Um, if you got real estate, if you're doing, you know, you know, if you're doing uh, improvements to the property, you're going to want to track all that so you can get the depreciation right. So that's the realm of accounting. But you and so having a centralized tracking database for accounting is very important for that. And that's why accountants really rely on that. But you can also track your own assets in a centralized place, just like accountants do. But you can have all of your bank accounts, all of your utility bills. You can just know, hey, these are my utility companies. These are my account numbers. You can have all of your account numbers and all that critical information in one central spot, which is just, I mean, it just takes a load off of all of this, it's not just a printed document in a folder in an accordion file somewhere. And in, in that moment of panic, you just, you know, you might not know where it is. Some people are better and more organized with this stuff than others. And, you know, you got to accommodate for people who might not have that. If you have an old, you know, older mom or something or older dad, you might need to help them. And having it in that central place is going to make it that much easier. Anyways, um, I'm going to open it up and... Um, I really, first off, just wanted to really thank all you guys. Let me just open everything up for uh, for you guys. Uh, if you want to unmute, please do. And uh, you can put on your video if you want. And if you guys are still there, and if I'm not just talking to myself, <laughs> let me know what questions you have. Griffin, what's up, man? All right. Griffin. Well, I just want to tell you, thank you for uh, having this on here. Um, I just came home from work right when it started, so I'm sorry about not having that link. But all good. Uh, Ryle was great, everyone, whoever's out there. Uh, he's been helping us 
We got with, Tim, uh, Tim's a fellow bear. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, helping us with our um, taxes and all and getting our books straight. So we really appreciate uh, his help. And we're definitely looking into um, this for our uh, future goals here very soon and working with Raul on this. So highly recommended. There's a lot of people getting older. There's a lot of transfer of assets that's going to have to happen. And the first thing that you got to just make sure you're doing is like, there's absolutely no reason for this to go to probate. And you want to just avoid that first and foremost. And most yep. people, that's where they're starting at. And that's as far as they want to go. For, or anyone else who's watching this video after the fact, just call me if you ever have questions. And I'm happy to have that discussion with you. And thank you again, man. I really appreciate you joining here. And... Um, I'm gonna sign out. Are you guys have any other yeah. last questions? No, I'm good. I'm gonna go eat. You you have a good night. You too, man. You guys all take care. All right, much all right, love, later. guys.